test. So good morning all and uh, thank you for coming to this talk. Uh, I am delighted today to introduce uh, Dr. Amar Awan, who is a senior researcher at Microsoft. Dr. Awan is the lead developer of the DeepSpeed Mixture of Experts system that uh, supports both training and the inference at scale. He received his bachelor's degree from the National University of Science and Technology in uh, Pakistan. His master's degree from the Kyung Hee University uh, in South Korea and uh, his PhD from the Ohio State University. He has published uh, several papers in conferences and journals related to systems and uh, 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 learning and training. And in the past, he worked uh, on a Java-based message passing interface with uh, OpenNP and MPI for scientific applications. His current research uh, uh, focus, focuses at the intersection of high performance systems and uh, large scale training and uh, inference of deep learning models. Uh, I should uh, mention that uh, in addition to this talk, uh, Dr. Awan will deliver a hands on uh, workshop uh, on deep speed today in the afternoon. Dr. Awan, welcome to KAUST. The floor is yours. So you guys can hear me? Okay. So thank you for the very uh, long introduction. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to believe that it's being taught about, told about you. So it's always a surprise. Uh, my name's Amar. Uh, I know some of you here, uh, and thank you everyone for coming. Uh, so I wanna talk about uh, this library um, at Microsoft that we develop, it's open source. Someone was asking me, will, will people have to buy anything? So no, you, you don't have to buy anything. It's open source, it's on GitHub. Uh, and uh, we are a team at Microsoft that develops this library, uh, but it's open source. So uh, a lot of community contributors work on that too. Uh, I basically structured my talk in a way that uh, we'll like the idea is to give a general landscape for pretty much everyone about trillion parameter scale model training and inference uh, if you use deep speed as a library. And given that you know we're from Microsoft, where our uh, sort of company's mission is to empower every person on the planet to do to, to achieve more. Uh, so I just added this bit at this very very morning because we do want to uh, address pretty much everyone. Uh, starting from very large scale where people have access to thousands of GPUs and clusters, but at the same time, also the people who do not have that. And, and so we do have this whole line of research, which we call democratization of AI. So I'm going to touch upon that as well. And then um, recently we've been working a lot on inference because now we have trained enough large models that we feel like, how do we use them uh, in practical scenarios? Uh, and then uh, finally, a little bit about usability and some, um, some open challenges, because I know this is a bit of an academic setting. So we've been given this talk uh, within Microsoft and at uh, more like company settings. So I'm going to uh, sort of give you some open challenges and have some interactive discussion. So feel free to you know, interrupt in the middle if, if, there, is, if there is a need. Uh, so what essentially is DeepSpeed? It's, it's a multi-purpose optimization suite. We didn't start that way. We started as a training library built on top of PyTorch. Uh, I hope everyone knows about PyTorch. Can I see a few show of hands? Like, great, okay. <laughs> uh, so it's built on top of PyTorch. So if you have a PyTorch model and you know how to train a PyTorch model, you already know how to run, how to use DeepSpeed. Uh, there is very little boilerplate around DeepSpeed that would make you sort of enable everything uh, in, in a transparent way. But then uh, slowly we have also evolved as a team, as a, as, a, as a library, and we started focusing on inference and compression. Uh, and, and recently even uh, there is this new pillar of deep speed, so to speak, we're talking to uh, various science labs uh, in US to develop something called deep speed for science. So it's a fairly evolving ecosystem in, in this space and, and we're very excited about that. Uh, so, I guess the, the main motivation for a lot of like this, this talk is kind of inspired by why do we need large models? And, uh, I, and I think 
the one one line answer for large models is the larger the model, the better is the accuracy. Whether you can explain it or not is a different game. Uh, but in general, uh, it's it's almost like saying like uh, a bigger car is better because just because it's bigger and you have more space in it. Uh, and so if you see this trend though, so it's it's also rooted in data. It's not just because you like it. It's also rooted in data. So if you see, uh, we started off with a really small model, like the Elmo model is like a 94 million. And when I say small, uh, if you if you are from computer vision, you'll be like, 94 million is not small. ResNet used to be just 25 million parameters. Uh, ResNet 50 was like the largest model that pretty much solved the ImageNet challenge. Uh, but things have since evolved significantly in terms of model scale. And, and BERT was a big breakthrough. It was 340 million. Uh, and you can see we've been constantly going up. So then Megatron 7 billion came out and then GPT-2 and GPT-3. And then eventually the largest dense model that we know of is the Megatron Turing NLG 530 billion, which was trained by Microsoft, NVIDIA, DeepSpeed team combined like together for months on, on, the, on the Celine supercomputer. Uh, so again, a lot of people have asked like, okay, so yeah, great. The large models are great and, and but only big companies can train them and they're better. The problem is we have not yet reached that diminishing return on these model scales. So we are still hopeful that if you keep increasing the size, uh, the, the accuracy on these tasks becomes better. So it's the size is still growing. It's not growing uh, sustainably though, uh, because the hardware is, is not there to catch it. And then they're also more compute efficient in some sense. So, so if you have a larger model, uh, it's more compute efficient to train it because you have larger gems, you have larger hidden dimensions, you have bigger matrices, and they're well suited for the hardware that we're training the models today, which is GPUs. So it makes sense to do that. But you know, given that I am from the Bing org, I also wanted to see like this new thing from, from Bing, which is like based on chat GPT or GPT-4 now, uh, what does it think about why large models are important? And so here is a funny sort of version of why it thinks large models are important. And I'll, I'll let you sort of read in the, in the slide deck if it's attached. But essentially, the answers that it gave me in both, and, and Bing has this mode uh, where you can actually chat with it and sort of set whether you want to be in the creative mode or balanced mode and precise mode. Uh, and, and based on that, you can actually tweak the responses of the model uh, to, to fit your, your needs. So for example, if you if you weren't wanted to uh, generate a poem, then you would probably choose a creative mode. So it has more liberty and uh, hallucinating or like making up stuff. Uh, but if you want a precise answer, then you can set it to precise mode. And, and interestingly enough, it also gave me a very good context. So when I asked it why large models are important in the precise mode, it gave me this very to the point answer, but then it also remembers the context and says, okay, well, tell me a bit more about specific examples. And the first thing it shows up is voice bots. Uh, and, and the second application shows this translation and third is content generation. So, so literally this is why these large models are important because they're changing the landscape of pretty much all things CS right now. Uh, it's, it's disruptive to the point where you're questioning from five years from now, not even five years, two years from now, will I be writing code by hand or will I be writing code through a model? Uh, it's, it's that effective as, as we have moved from a smaller model to a larger model. Uh, and, and so that's in some sense for, for growth oriented sort of community, it's, it's great. But then there's also the scare factor, right? That's like, oh, you're disrupting our jobs. You're, you're taking away this space for content creators. And, and that's not true. And, and that's, th 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 there's a lot of debate about why these large models are important. But I think one of the aspects there is it touches pretty much every single aspect of how we program computers moving forward. Uh, and so that's why if you never train a large model, you should probably care about it now. Uh, and if you care about large models, then immediately, I think, and that's the most more, more interesting bit for this audience and also in, in general, the people who are in HPC and large scale systems is that these models need parallelism. Uh, and um, what, what this chart, and I'm sorry about the, the purple color here, this just says approximately 1.2. So if you, if you have heard about data parallelism, which is the single sort of sim simplest, easiest strategy to train models at scale. Uh, it can scale very well. You can use thousands of GPUs. Uh, and I think Professor Pano is telling me that uh, you're training BERT at, at a thousand GPU scale, right? Uh, and BERT is 345 million. 
Um, so it's it's a great model to train at with data parallelism. But what if your model is not? What if your model is bigger than that? So the the limit of GPU memory is 1.2 billion parameters. You can train on one, a 40 gig 800 GPU. With beyond 1.2 billion, you cannot train it. So so well, what do you do then? Okay, uh, what you do is something called model parallelism or tensor parallelism, and you split. Uh, the these uh, natural language processing the NLP models in a specific way where you split the MLP part across multiple GPUs and then you do communication and and that's called tensor parallelism or tensor slicing uh, and that pushes your sort of model scale from 1 billion to 20 billion and then you can like now you you can train almost like a 15 16 x bigger model on the same hardware but there is there is a challenge there the challenge is that it needs a model rewrite so you really need to know uh, what you're doing, you need to edit the model and go in a specific part of the model and insert communication there and do it effectively. If you do it wrong, then you're also having a lot of problems. Uh, efficiency wise, they're good, but they don't scale. So you cannot scale tensor parallelism beyond eight or 16 GPUs, eight being eight A100s in a DGX box, 16 being 16 V100s in a DGX box. Outside of Node though, the tensor parallelism doesn't really scale. So then people said, okay, well, that's, that's fine because we know how to combine them. So we'll do tensor parallelism and data parallelism. So that's the third, third row. So MP plus DP is model parallelism plus data parallelism. So now you can train 20 billion at a thousand GPU scale and, and, and life is good. Uh, but what if, if you wanna go larger than that, then you will do something called pipeline parallelism. Uh, uh, in the literature, it's also called layer parallelism where you're like, okay, if I have 100 layers, I have 100 GPUs, I can just put one layer on one GPU. End of story, you can train a lot a lot longer. So a lot, lot, lot bigger. So the approximate scale there is like a 100 billion parameter model. But pipeline parallelism has its own sort of communication challenges. There is like the GPipe paper talks about it. There is a bubble that becomes in a pipeline. Uh, that bubble can introduce major overheads. Then people came around with different ways. Pipeline parallelism is also fairly involved when it comes to model rewrite. So a model scientist would not want to rewrite their model because uh, you have to almost add boundary communication like send and receive and make it hard. So, so that's why it's harder. And then on top of that, if you combine pipeline parallelism with data parallelism, it's even harder. So all of these approaches that we're talking about up there are approaches in the literature which address large model training through parallelism approaches. And then we have something we call at, at deep speed uh, zero. Uh, which is a short word for zero redundancy optimizer. And uh, our team has been super sort of involved in training these large models because we sit inside Microsoft's Bing uh, and our sort of daily activities involve around how can the Bing team train the largest possible model for their workloads consistently. And so we, we profiled these models and, and their memory usage patterns and figured out a way that it's still data parallelism but it's fully sharded. And, uh, and, and that allows you to not have to rewrite your models, but get all the benefits of data parallelism plus model parallelism plus pipeline parallelism and train the largest possible model. So what it has given us is like, this is a statement that we, we make for people to, to get the idea of why we want to give this zero approach. And so if you wanna do this democratization of large model training, that is everyone should be able to train them, then, the first thing you need is a solution that is easy to use. That is a model scientist can actually not worry about how this will orchestrate on a cluster. All they care about is this is my model, train it on a thousand GPUs. So that's the first promise or first sort of challenge that we, we should resolve with, with zero. The second is great if you can do it easy, but what if it's not efficient? So you also want to have a highly efficient scheme to do this parallelism. And that's what zero, zero offers. So that if, if you really care about a significant sort of differentiation of deep speed versus any other deep learning framework out there, it is the zero family of technologies. And, and we have these zero. So if you read the zero paper, we have zero stage one, two, three, uh, and then zero offload our infinity, which actually in, allowed us to train trillion parameter scale models uh, and not just us. So, so here is a list of deep speed powered massive models. And you can see 5 billion, 17 billion, a bunch of 20 billion scale models, 100 billion. And then uh, the largest one is of course the, the Megatron itself, which was trained at NVIDIA, but uh, NVIDIA and Microsoft, but uh, the Jurassic one or the Bloom, they're all fairly large models. And there is no other way to train them other than uh, relying on uh, this tech that is built 
in, in part of deep speed. Uh, so this this chart kind of summarizes the a few dimensions. I, it's it's fairly involved, so I won't go into the details of it. Uh, but what we are essentially saying is your model scale is really crossing out. Your memory is not increasing. So your memory used to be 16 GB, then 30, 32 gigabytes, and then eventually 40 and 80 gigabytes. No way near the scale of what models are, are going to. And so deep speed sort of offers this approach at the end where we have like this two year span where zero technologies enabled us uh, almost like a 4,000 4, X speed up, uh, which is kind of consistent with the, with the, with this, with the model scale that we're seeing now. Uh, so that's the first dimension that deep speed sort of enables. And, and there is a bunch of technologies that we have listed here. Every one of these bullet points is like one paper or a few papers uh, published in, you know, like SC and similar conferences. So you're welcome to take a look there. Uh, and, and I just want to emphasize though, like just because technology exists doesn't mean that there are trillions of parameters of models. So having the system capability to train models versus having an actual model of that many million parameters are two different are two different problems. Uh, so DeepSpeed provides you the system capability in order to train a trillion parameter model, there's a whole other ordeal that, that a company or a university has to take uh, and a bunch of model scientists and system people have to come together to do that. Uh, so that's what we did for the 530 billion model. Then we also can you know, talk about the speed aspect where um, we, we do care about how, how fast in terms of your throughput per GPU uh, can, can DeepSpeed offer. Uh, and so, so if, if you see this one, the bird training record was uh, somewhat of uh, 236 minutes with the first record that NVIDIA created with their ML perfecting submission. And then eventually we, we, we did with the deep speed, brought it down by a factor of two. Uh, and then the fastest sort of bird training record was with deep speed for a long, long time, uh, which was 44 minutes on, on uh, 1024 V100s. After that, um, because the model scale increased a lot, so we kind of moved away from BERT records kind of thing. Uh, the second dimension here is just showing like the, the speed up that we are getting through zero is interesting because it's, it's almost super linear. And this is counterintuitive for a lot of HPC people as well, because they're like, well, why are you doing it? How, how is that possible? Like when we, when we wrote the paper, there were like a lot of objections from the reviewers in that aspect. And, and, and the good way to think about it is that because zero, is sharding everything in your model across multiple GPUs. Now you have a lot more memory to work with on the GPU, which effectively allows you to increase your batch size on that same hardware. So now you're running a much larger batch size, hence your compute efficiency is much greater. So as you're increasing the model size and you're increasing the number of GPUs, you're also getting a much more bigger speed up, which is, which is super linear, which is not, which is not sublinear linear, it's actually super linear. So, so that's one of the biggest promises with this kind of approach, uh, given, given you can do a large batch size. Uh, this is the other dimension I'm talking about, the democratization of AI. So, well, what if you only have a single node? Like, I think a lot of university environments and a lot of like smaller research labs have these two, three, four DGX boxes. They've, you know, purchased them for experimentation or model scientists. And so we, we work on this, and I think this is just a different way of looking at that table where data parallel is restricted to still 1.4 billion parameters or so on the, on the 40 gigs, 800s. Uh, and then we introduce something called zero offload and then zero infinity. And zero infinity is kind of like the green line is showing you can train a 1 trillion parameter model on a single GPU box. Uh, single GPU is the wrong word here. Single GPU box means the single GPU node, the, the, the A100 or the V100 DTX box. It's actually 700 times bigger than a model that you would train uh, with the standard data parallelism or PyTorch or, or the baseline technology. Uh, so that's the promise of all of this research uh, of, of the zero line of optimizations. Uh, there is also another direction in which we work because a lot of at scale computers were built before deep learning started to come. And so there was like low bandwidth in uh, interconnects, uh, older infinity bands or even ethernet. So this one bit Adam, uh, which is my, one of my first works when I actually joined uh, the deep speed team was to, to focus on compressing the gradient or the momentum term in the Adam optimizer uh, and, and bring down the communication volume. So we can, we can train this on a larger set of scale. There's a lot of interesting results on, along this. So I'll, I'll probably push that. And, and, and this is like trying to show you that effectively uh, this one bit scheme allows your uh, one bit atom on ethernet to be equal to your full atom on, on infinity band. 
And so it's, it's a great promise because uh, we had these P100 and V100 GPUs on Azure clusters where the, the network was like 40 gig InfiniBand or Ethernet. And we were still able to train them on multiple such nodes. We didn't want to waste those nodes. And, and with one bit Adam, we were able to do that. Uh, but as, as you know, some of you might know that LAMB is, is, the, uh, is the preferred optimizer for BERT uh, large batch training. Uh, so then we eventually extended this one bit Adam family to one bit LAMB and then zero one Adam. Uh, and so these kind of technologies are sort of allowing you to uh, to, to, to democratize this for, for, for non sort of state of the art hardware. Uh, the other direction uh, in which some of the colleagues work who have since left Microsoft is one of them is sparse attention. So much longer sequence lengths for some interesting problems in science, which have now started to pop up again. And, and so I'll, I'll, I'll briefly touch upon that. It, it was enabling us almost 10 X longer sequences uh, through that sparse attention feature. Uh, we also did some something called progressive layer drop, which allows us to selectively prune certain layers from the model, so you can uh, train the model much faster uh, by 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 removing certain parts of the model. So it's kind of like a pruning approach, uh, and and we still use it. It's fairly fairly robust uh, for for some model families. Switching from training a little bit to the inference, uh, this is a chart which kind of summarizes a huge landscape of inference. So as your model size changes, your system system optimization that you would apply for inference would be different. And so with DeepSpeed, it's a very really challenging thing for us because people and Microsoft come and say, hey, I have this 76 million parameter model and I'm trying to you know, deploy it with the two GPUs. So the optimization that we would do for that would be completely different from versus something like a, the, the blue model, which is 176 billion. And people wanna, you, you can't even do that on a single GPU. You have to do inference on eight GPUs for that or, or four GPUs if you, if you do quantization. So, so we are presenting these sort of numbers to show over PyTorch, what are the benefits if you use deep speed inference module. And the way we, the way we do it is we have these three sort of families of optimizations, many GPU optimizations, single GPU uh, kernel fusion, and then zero inference, which kind of allows you to train larger models. Again, the democratization of approach, large model on a single GPU device through offloading uh, your weights to the CPU memory. So that's some of the brief inference thing. And then finally, uh, how simple or hard it, a, a tool to use, then I think the adoption really depends upon that. So very few lines of changes needed for the code. I'll actually show you a snippet right next. Uh, we are also, uh, a, a backend for this famous hugging face uh, PyTorch Lightning software, which allows easier model building uh, or there are good open source model ecosystems built on top of PyTorch. Um, and then from infrastructure perspective, we are agnostic. So I'm, I'm happy to share that, you know, Mosin has been helping me with setting up deep speed on the Ibex cluster. We are able to run there. We are running on Azure ML as the mainstream solution from Azure ML. We are running on Azure instances where people have, you know, they purchase VMs and create Kubernetes clusters. You can also install deep speed on your local computers, like any, any surface laptop, which has a GPU, you can actually use deep speed kernels to, you know, generate images with stable diffusion 10 X faster or something. So, so about, like we we're pretty much platform agnostic in that sense. And the usability perspective, there are like two, two key things. One is like, let's say you have a model, uh, you just need to wrap the model with something called deep speed get initialize. And the optimizations that you will set from deep speed are, are through a config file or a config dictionary. You define this and say, okay, I wanna do zero stage three. I wanna offload my optimizer states to the CPU or NVMe, set that here, uh, change your training loop slightly from uh, like your model dot backward instead of model dot backward, you're just doing engine dot backward and doing engine dot step. So these three lines would enable any PyTorch model with deep speed uh, out of the box. Like there is no other thing that you need, no other fancy feature. If you wanna activate fancy features, there is a ton of them, there's a huge guide, uh, but this gets the job done for the first type of prototype you wanna do. So it's fairly, we've, we've kept it fairly simple to use so that you don't need to learn a new language to actually use deep speed. It's just, if you know PyTorch, you know deep speed. Uh, so that's how the things have been. and. Uh, overall, we've seen almost 10 X year over year growth with this, you know, it's, uh, we, we celebrated sort of our third birthday uh, uh, a month ago for deep speed. Uh, since that, since the initial time, 2 million plus installs have happened from the, from the PIP, uh, the PyPy package, uh, 300 packages are having hard dependencies on deep speed. Pretty much everyone from national labs to companies to small, like startups like Eleuther AI or stability, they're using deep speed for very interesting problems. Sometimes the problems that we don't even understand. 
Uh, so we are a, primarily a systems team, and then we have some model science folks with us. Uh, but we are, we're always fascinated by the way people use deep speed uh, in, in, in a bunch of application areas. So with that, I'll, I'll sort of stop and uh, maybe take a question or two if there is any. Uh, and uh, then I'll do a little bit of deep dive in zero infinity. Uh, Mosin, if, if, is, is it okay? Like if you take some questions? Thank you for a great talk. Um, could you give like a very high level, um, let's say, commentary on the difference between Deep Speed and Berkeley's project Alpa? Okay. Uh, interesting. Uh, so, uh, so Alpa folks have been uh, they are more recent uh, in in terms of the the technology that they've been working on. Uh, two two of the people from Berkeley actually joined our team from the from the same group research group because like I think we that's where we hired from uh, so we do have a sort of friendly collaborative terms with Alpa um, we uh, personally I have not tried it so I cannot really comment on like really creating a difference but I think as far as I understood the they were trying to do some communication related optimizations that's where the Alpha project actually first started but now they have become more so one of the things with all these open source deep learning frameworks has been that there are a lot of like similarities but then sometimes it's just a bit easier for someone to take a feature and implement it in their own framework uh, so i think some of the features from deep speed have been taken by other frameworks and have been re-implemented since that so yeah but but I would I would look a bit more into Alpha and probably get back to you. Yeah, I have not had a chance personally to look at it. So it's right, right. Yeah, and and so so I think uh, there was this student this morning who met me and they were trying to do a three D convolution, which actually yeah there he is, runs out of memory, and so uh, like a, it's almost like you need a distributed gem for that. Uh, and that kind of approach is very model specific. So I think there are, there are alpha optimizations do lie in that that frontier. Whereas with zero, it's it's sort of like a generic way of sharding that one parameter across all of the memory space that you have. So if you have GPUs or CPU memory or NVMe, it pretty much allows you to shard that entire thing across all those devices. Uh, so um, depends on like the trade-offs that you have from memory perspective versus the network bandwidth or the intra node bandwidth perspective, things will change. Um, yeah. Can I ask a couple of questions? So thank you. Uh, so how, like mostly like organization question, uh, how do you handle this big amount of features? So because like PyTorch, they provide documentation and you decided to make step forward. Mm -hmm. uh, so is it, so you, pro you have provided like simple JSON description how I should configure this, but if look into the glory details, it will be like, I don't know, 1000 pages description. <laughs> and second question, for how long does it take for you to create this and how much people was involved in this project? Uh, you said great? No, not great. Uh, so just how, how, how much time does it take to create this project? Oh, okay. okay. So, so our team, um, so DeepSpeed team is relatively a smaller team. It used to be a smaller team. When he started, it was three years ago, it was like four people. Uh, so like the first zero paper has four authors. That was literally the DeepSpeed team. Uh, then when I joined, I was the sixth person in the team. Uh, we now have around uh, 30 plus people in the team. So that's why you see that the pace of optimizations and maintenance of the features has become a relatively better, sort of more better. We, we, we never intended for DeepSpeed to be a, production ready software. We, it was a bunch of researchers trying to do some prototyping and research prototypes. Uh, it just happened to be that this became really successful as a project. And so we kept on expanding our scope, uh, but there are still like every feature has few core maintainers behind it. So like there are like three people behind one bit Adam, four people behind one, uh, the MOE models, four people behind zero infinity. And then we collaborate and uh, sort of build on top of each other expertise, expertise to build every new feature. And once it's there, it's kind of like in maintenance mode. So uh, there are a bunch of interns joined, they were doing community collaboration is also happening. Like a lot of like on GitHub, if you go, our issues are actually solved by our own users sometimes uh, because there is enough knowledge out there now. So, um, so that's how we kind of do it uh, overall. 
uh, in general. It's, it's challenging. Sometimes we are like, okay, we have 500 open issues on GitHub. I don't know how to close them. <laughs> so <laughs> we, we, do, we do software meetups every, every other uh, week uh, or sometimes even weekly basis and try to say, okay, let's reduce the number of issues. But we close 20 and then 40 more open. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it's fun. Does that give you some perspective? Okay. Right. 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 I would say uh, um, our manager uh, Yushong He is she's just awesome uh, in 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 having such a large team. But then we still operate like as a small like group. We we talk pretty much every week, uh, twice every week, uh, on these cutting edge issues that are coming, and uh, the people are really really. Uh, sort of awesome who are who are part of this team. So I, I think like I have worked at many other teams as well, and I would just sort of give all the credit to great management and also great collaboration within the team. So they're all aligned on uh, let's just make this feature. Like that's why you'll see like I think our MOE paper had like six, uh, ten authors or something, and we all worked on that together. And uh, just like okay, we have a timeline. We have to do this in six weeks. And then we just like all came together, stopped everything else that we were exploring, did that feature, released it, and then sort of went back to our own research problems. And then came back again after like a few months and say, oh, now this is this new thing we have to resolve. So that's how kind of like it's, I know it's subjective. <laughs> uh, it's hard to sort of share pretty much all the details, but that's how, that's how we, we operate. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so I have two questions, actually. First, I like how uh, industry providing their graph, especially Microsoft and NVIDIA. Sometimes they have their own graph that shows something and hides something. <laughs> so I have a question about one graph that you showed about running on a single GPU with very big model. So you showed the number of samples per second. Okay, and you show that deep speed can actually provide very fast. Yeah, uh, no, the slides before. After. Okay, this one? Yes. Okay. Okay, so you are showing the samples per second. I'm a little bit worried about the total training time okay. for this big model on one GPU. Mm -hmm. So do you have any numbers for this? This one is not on one GPU, by the way. So this one is uh, actually a trend line. So it's from two, four, eight, sixteen GPUs. And, and the graph basically is trying to just show that before we did this compression, it was sort of, it didn't make sense to go from two to four. It was okay, some benefit. But then from four to eight and 16, you saw the gray line is the baseline, which is like standard PyTorch and full 16-bit FP16 Adam. So it doesn't scale because we know that the buffer is so big. When you do all reduce on it, it just doesn't scale. Right? On Ethernet, you can't do anything. Uh, but what you can do, though, is reduce it. So we compress that. And, and here we're saying 2.7x faster for BERT fine-tuning, which means that let's say you have a trained BERT model, and now you want to fine-tune it for some time. In fine tuning, the biggest challenge is you have a really small batch size. So you can't say, oh, I'll just bump the batch size and, and come over the reduction problem. You can't do that. So the only way to do that is uh, through, through compression. And here, uh, we're not comparing against any other library. We are just comparing it actually our, against our own selves. Uh, like if you apply one bit atom versus you don't apply one bit atom. And, and also two different networks. So InfiniBand versus Ethernet, right? And, and you can see like on the slower network, we have 6.2 x speed up because we know but that network to start with was not really suitable. Whereas in the InfiniBand, like if you see the speed up is just like 60, 70%. So, so yeah, so that's, this graph is pretty much non-competitive in, in, in some sense. Okay, uh, about the, the second question about the table that you showed the parallelization a method that we can use with different, I think it's on the first this set of slides. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, what about this zero parallelism? Uh, do we need for different models, do we need to adapt or do any kind of code changes uh, to have better parallelization like uh, what we have on the model parallel mm -hmm. version or not? Yeah. So I think uh, that's a great question. We'll have a lot of this hands-on exercise session in which we'll actually play with zero stages. Uh, but in general, the way I think about it is uh, small models, you will do zero stage one. Uh, when I say small, it's like the 1 billion, 2 billion parameter range. Then you, if you want to go from greater than 1 billion and maybe less than 10 billion, you will do zero stage two. Uh, if you want to grow bigger than 10 billion model, you'll do zero stage three. So that's a simple heuristic that you can apply. Then uh, depending on sometimes the hardware is not as efficient as we would want it to be. So like if it's not the state of the art A100 NVIDIA DGX box, then you don't have eight NV links or eight infiniband cards, then you want to scale out. You might not be able to do that with 
out of the box vanilla 03. So you might want to do gradient or activation checkpointing. You would want to do zero offload so that you can bump up the batch size. Uh, so you will do certain hyperparameter optimization in that aspect. It is still simpler than uh, actually trying to write anything with tensor parallelism. Uh, that's my personal experience. Like I have, like if you if you have model X and you want to tensor parallelize it, it's non-trivial. Uh, it's non-trivial, and if you if you want to really understand why it's non-trivial, open the Megatron LM code base, and you will be seeing huge infrastructure around why do you want to hack which layer and insert the all reduce at which layer and insert the reduce scatter all gather where and then it has to be differentiable so you'll do a forward and then a backward you'll have to do the reverse operation all of that jazz is fairly involved that i am not really looking forward to and i'm trying to train a gpt model like all i care about is i want to train a gpt with 10 billion parameters so zero i think is the reason why zero got adopted so fast is you just have to change a number and experiment run the experiment again you don't have to change the model think about the model structure or gpu structure or uh, do this back of the anvil of bandwidth calculation. So that's the kind of promise that zero brings over these approaches. But but that doesn't mean we don't support these. We do support the complementary approaches. So zero plus model parallelism or tensor parallelism is still supported. Zero plus pipeline parallelism is still supported. We just feel that for a bunch of major major majority of the model scientists, they don't need anything beyond zero. But for advanced use cases, sure. And and then I think I'll talk about MOE, which is a completely new dimension. It's not even listed on this table. It's called expert parallelism. Last question here before. Uh, yeah, thank you for the great talk. I just have like one little question. Uh, since it looks like really easy to migrate to using it, especially if you're already using PyTorch Lightning. So my question is, uh, can we gain something if we use this engine uh, as like an everyday engine for medium sized or even small models or do you only get the benefits with the large scale models uh, only uh, a great question um I, I think like one of the things that i've seen is the biggest benefits or the biggest users of deep speed are the people who are at this really um, sweet boundary of this 1 billion parameter scale so the moment you reach that you you can see already that okay i cannot train this with data parallelism and i need something beyond it and the, the immediate next solution is tensor parallelism, which, as I said, is one, it's model specific. It only works for transformers uh, because you have an attention block and an MLP block. So you can only split the MLP block with tensor parallelism out of the box in Megatron. Uh, second, it's, it's, it's a call between, okay, do I want to really understand parallelism or I just want to train this model? So if you are of that first group who wants to just see, I have this 1 billion model and I want to train it and my GPU memory is not sufficient and I want to do something, then Zero is your friend. Deep speed is your friend. Uh, because all you just need to do is just in the config JSON, you just say stage two, it will take care of the rest. Uh, so for quick experimentation, it's it's still the most powerful tool, I think, despite having all these other sort of more involved fancy approaches. Uh, performance is another story. So performance is always like it comes after you have some proof of concept. So, so I think like it, there may be people who would just immediately write everything with zero, experiment with their model, and then learn more advanced techniques and come combine zero with tensor parallelism because it makes sense for them. But for a vast majority, no. Yeah, so that, that would be my take on it. All right, so I think we've taken sufficient time on questions and, and I, I do wanna sort of cover all the slides if, if possible. Uh, so so we, I have two deep dives. One is in the zero infinity or how, how zero infinity works. Uh, I'll, I'll go over it quickly, not in a lot of detail. Uh, but I think just bringing that model chart back, the landscape of models, as you all know, uh, is by now you probably have understood why why zero is important because of this red line. So that line just coincides with the very slow growth in the GPU memory space. Uh, so hitting the GPU memory wall. Second is the accessibility to large model training itself. Uh, GPT-3 is a famous model. Everyone wants to fine tune that model. OpenAI has APIs for that. Uh, there are public open source bloom kind of models on that same scale. Uh, but if you want to fine tune it, you really, really need resources. So, so, so deep speed kind of allows that accessibility uh, for a single box fine tuning of, of GPT-3 scale. Uh, and then uh, again, the model code re refactoring. So all of these are, are the existing landscape that we want to move away from. And that's what zero provides. Uh, so just this this gives you a little bit of perspective on what when we talk about memory, if you see the GPU memory is a tiny fraction of the actual memory available on any device. And and I was talking to Mosin yesterday, and and like I, I shared with him that we have an optimizer called CPU Adam. 
So when we move the model optimizer states to CPU, we actually do some compute on CPU as well in case of offloaded scenarios. And it's helpful to understand that your NVMe is the largest storage. So if you have a way to move data between NVMe and, and, and GPUs, you have a lot you have a lot of sort of like leverage uh, and, and that enables you to train those massive scale model on single machines. And so here I'm, I'm, I'm showing that you can leverage uh, like the GPU, CPU and view combined memory. Uh, and you can almost train like a 30 trillion parameter on 32 nodes. Or if you want to think about it simply, it's like one trillion parameter on a single node, uh, which means that you can easily fine tune a GPT style or GPT three scale model on, on one box. Uh, which is which is very promising because there is actual practical use case for that. Uh, let, let's imagine you have a lab where you have a specific language that you that you have like reports written in, or you have a data set which is very local and it's private and you don't want to share it. And now you want to train this massive GPT three and fine tune it on your data set. And you have a single DGX box. If you use Deep Speed, you can do it. If you have like in standard PyTorch, you will just run out of memory. So so that's the sort of like promise that that Deep Speed provides. But how do you how do we actually leverage it? Uh, what what we do is uh, through through zero uh, we 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 enable this from the front end perspective, so you don't have to do any model code refactoring. But behind the behind the scenes, what happens is that if you if you look at this perspective from a model, so you have like layer zero, layer one, layer two, standard data parallel training would just say, okay, I have replica on replica one of the model, replica two of the model, replica three of the model, and that's how you do data parallel training. It's also called replicated training. Uh, but what we found out is that you don't actually need it. You can move uh, different parts of the model without having the user involved with that. So you can you can say, I'll just put layer zero on GPU zero, layer one on GPU one, and layer two on GPU two. This, if you think about it, it's just like similar to what pipeline parallelism says or layer parallelism says. But here, the difference is we are doing it. The user doesn't know, and the user doesn't have to know uh, because what we are moving is the gradients or the optimizer states, which is just a huge chunk of memory that the framework needs to operate properly for back propagation. And that has nothing to do with actual model size. It's just like it's a, it's a multiplier over the model size. And, and so that's, that's the promise of zero for, for, the, for this case. But then there is also this problem that if you take this approach, there is a limitation. So now we're trying to show that the PCIe here is what you're going to use between the CPU or sort of NVMe memory. And if you do this, your required memory for efficiency is, is 25 to 60 gigabytes. But what is the PCIe bandwidth? I think Gen 3 is 12.8. Gen 4 is like 20, but also questionable. You don't really achieve 20. So then what we said is, well, if we, if we use this approach, it's not good. So initially we did zero stage two offload in this way, but then with zero infinity, we just flipped the problem a little bit. And we said, okay, what about we split the split all of them and 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 make them in so like if we go back, you will see that instead of the layer way, layer approach, you just actually horizontally split it and you partition each tensor or parameter across all of them. And that way, what you can do is now you can bring them together. And so now you have effectively you're leveraging the combined GP, uh, sorry, the, the, the PCIe bandwidth of all the GPUs devices. And so now you increase the GPU count, you also increase the effective available bandwidth. And, and that just makes it super simple. So when, when we first proposed it, we were like, oh, bringing memory from GPU to CPU is no go, it's, it's never going to work. But actually works pretty well. So the, the teraflops do not change a lot, even with the offload feature enabled. So that's, that's what the promise of zero infinity is. Uh, and there is a very nice animation that I'll just sort of hold and you can see how, how things orchestrate while I just grab some water. So I'll I'll send, I'll give this MP4 to to Mohsen if you want to see it. It's it's a really interesting picture to to pretty much sum up whatever I said. Uh, it just it just does better than my. Uh, yes, every time. So so every. Uh, time you want to touch a parameter and it's sharded across all the GPUs, you will do an all gather and, yeah. and then that will be available. But I think here, the, the key point here in 03 infinity is that we are designing this system where we are trading off network bandwidth for memory, right? 
So we are limited by the GPU memory, right? And so we're saying, okay, well, what if memory was not a problem? We have CPU memory. But then you really, really need to have this NVLink connected GPUs and, and parallel PCIe bandwidth available. So that enables you. So even doing that all gather is not an overhead because you have a really fast interconnect uh, for, for these devices. So if you had a bad interconnect, then I don't know, then you would need something like a one bit zero or something. Uh, yeah, so that would be like an even advanced scheme. Uh, we have yet to we have yet to go there. Uh, yeah. So so that I just I think I just want to recap with the with the same thing. Uh, th these were certain graphs that we presented earlier. Uh, all of these promises of zero infinity, uh, uh, zero hold for zero infinity because it's built on top of that. So zero infinity is this feature that enables you the CPU and NVMe offload. Zero itself is just a way of partitioning the model uh, transparently. Okay, so now I wanted to just sort of briefly touch upon some of the open challenges, right? So I think the, this community is slightly different from where where I come from. So I, I sit in inside Microsoft, the use case is very clear. We know the model team, they talk to us and we're done. We know, okay, this is your model size. This is how we'll tweak it. The, the clusters are there, the ecosystem is there. But now what we are seeing is that deep speed is being used in, in, in ways that we didn't envision and we didn't know. And there is also the, the promise of large language models is now sort of getting explored by various national labs. So Oak Ridge, uh, we had this boff at SC uh, with, with the, all the folks from uh, Oak Ridge and uh, Livermore, and uh, they came together in a boff and they said, well, we're using you know, transformers for scale. I think that was the name of the boff. And then we found out that some people at Oak Ridge are training these models where they have these reports uh, written by, by, by clinical uh, staff. And those reports are fairly long. Uh, and then sometimes they also have images that they convert to sort of a 1D array of tokens and they feed it into a vision transformer. Uh, and what we saw is that they really, really need large sequence lengths. So a standard model like GPT-2, 3, when you train it, the sequence length is like 1,000 tokens, 2,000 tokens max. But these, we're talking about 64,000 tokens at a time. So then some open questions are, well, in such scenarios, will a larger model make sense for my task or will a larger sequence length make more sense? Because there is this nice picture from, I think from Cerebras or somewhere where they have this radiology image, which, which is having some image with the cancer and image without a cancer. And then you have the sliding window and that context window, the bigger that window, the more data the model has to actually work on and do a classification of that report as malignant or not. And, and so, so that's a fundamental problem. And, and it's an open problem because we don't know that. And, and also like none of the frameworks were designed ever to run with such large sequence lengths. So, so we are exploring that. So I, I believe that there are some you know, science groups here involved with, with, with language models or, or, or these transformer models. Uh, and they would be interested in sort of seeing this or exploring this with us. So we are almost trying to make a open source consortium around deep speed for science where we are finding collaborators. The other, I think they mentioned is the sparse models family. So a lot of people have said, well, there is a lot of sparsity in models. Can we actually do sparse computation, sparse attention? Uh, and then newer hardware architectures are appearing for, for such kind of things. I think Cerebras is one of them. Uh, and finally, the democratization of the, the large model training. It's, it's an open question. Uh, you can use certain older generation of hardware now that you have this approach to like there is like CPU Adam can you know take advantage of multiple cores to do optimization on that. So can you do hybrid training uh, with older GPUs and older CPUs? So these are some of the open challenges that I would want like sort of like a call for action. If you have any approach us, let us know. We would love to collaborate. Um, things are in open source, so feel free to open a PR or whatever, and and we can we can go from there. Uh, for the lack of time, I, I will briefly touch upon this. I, I, to me, it's the most exciting area also because I just sort of happened to be leading this at Microsoft at, at DeepSpeed team. Uh, these are called a mixture of expert models. They're not, not new. Um, they have been around for a while, uh, but it got really, really famous with the, with the G shard and then subsequently the switch transformer paper from, from Google. And the idea is that for, uh, and this is a picture if you're interested, but like this is basically trying to show that the parallelism is now part of the model itself. So the, it's, it's even one step harder than tensor parallelism where you had a model and you had to think about how to parallelize it. The model itself now is by design a parallel model and it wants to be on different GPUs. <laughs> so that's, that's what they call expert parallelism. Mm -hmm. 
And, and the promise with dense versus uh, MOE is that MOE is a sparse model, which what means is that some, some parts of the model are not active at, at any given point in time. Only one part of that model through a gated function is active. Uh, so it might be, it, it, it basically gives you this capability to scale your model parameters to a really large space, but then the flops are not proportionally increasing. So you have a more flop efficient version of, of the same model with a lot of parameters. Uh, and this has proven to be really, really good for multi-model use cases, multilingual translation cases where you have multiple languages. So each expert is sort of like learning a language or each expert is learning a different task. Like if you have a multi-task model, uh, but they are extremely hard in the, in the sense that people were like, oh, tensor parallelism was hard. Now you have expert parallelism. How the heck are we gonna ever train these kind of models? Model scientists don't wanna do this. Uh, so, so, so you can think of expert parallelism as data and model parallelism combined within the same model because some parts of the model are replicated, some part of sh are shorted. Uh, and then uh, it nicely aligns with what we did in zero. So that's why we kind of combined it as a system support uh, and offered that as very transparent. But effectively from a MPI perspective, like the people who understand MPI and communication, it's all to alls two all to alls in the forward pass, two all to alls in the backward pass, because all to all is a symmetric operation. So the forward of it is differentiable backward is the same as the, as the all to all. So you can in, insert these in, in the MLP layers of the model and you can effectively do this expert parallelism. But there's a lot of performance trade off and at Microsoft and at least in our team, we do think that MOE models are one way to achieve the next generation of AI scale on existing hardware because we know that we're not building an 800 gigabyte GPU anytime soon. And we also know that the dense model family sort of like the, at the 500 billion scale, people have stopped really scaling dense model beyond because it's, it's practically not possible. It's like the dollar, the dollar amount that you need to invest or the GPUs that you need are just not there, even, even for the largest cloud source providers. So, uh, MOE had limited scope in translation. The, the first time we were trying to explore, we were just seeing, but does it work for NLG or GPT style generative models? And then also the inference performance was because, well, if your model size is big, uh, how are you gonna infer on it? Uh, so we, we, we approached these challenges in very different ways. We have like two blog posts, one SC paper uh, called Deep Speed Inference and presented it like in November. Uh, and, and so this was the first one in which we just explored a little bit of whether MOE training in deep speed can make sense. Uh, and then we sort of like uh, had a second blog where we advanced some of our original techniques and then also enabled some of the inference on those trained uh, MOE models. Uh, and you can see like all of these are just trying to show if we had PyTorch MOE versus if you have deep speed MOE, it is a 10x latency gap for inference. If you want to train, we have a 5x higher throughput uh, compared to a quality equivalent dense model. If you want to do uh, efficient MOE architectures, we also did some model science where we have mixture of students and uh, py pyramid residual MOE or PR MOE. It's a lot more detail and then I can cover in a, in a small talk like this. I usually have like a two hour talk just on MOE. So uh, if, you, if you are interested, you know, we can always talk about it offline. Uh, but I do, I do invite people to explore this and read a bit about it. They are the next generation of models most likely will be MOE models. Uh, but as, as with all things deep speed, this is also fairly simple to use. So you, you still continue to do everything the same way you did, but you also have to now change your model slightly. Uh, I wanted to make sure that it's not as hard as the tensor parallelism in Megatron because it's, it is hard. Like I have been working with that. So what we did is we just introduced this API called MOE and you, you insert this MOE sort of wrapper inside your MLP layer of any transformer and the rest is taken care of how, how experts are initialized and how all to all has happened. The user has no idea about it. Uh, so that's the sort of promise with the deep speed MOE. A uh, bunch of training performance numbers. I, I think I will not be able to go over them. Uh, but, but essentially like they're trying to show, I think one takeaway from this is you can see this chart and immediately see, okay, I have a 1.3 billion dense model. Uh, if I want to do 128 experts, so 1.3 billion plus 128 experts is the blue line. That's effectively a 52 billion model. So about eight X larger. Uh, but then it's the, the performance or the loss curve of that matches the $6.7 billion model, which is about five X larger than the dense model. So this equation kind of like shows you, you can do five X lower training cost to achieve the same accuracy. And that's the, the promise, despite having eight X more parameters uh, in, 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 the, in the model. 
Uh, and the same challenge holds for the inference. So like if, if you have a lot of parameters, how are you gonna do it? Uh, because of the unique properties of MOE, which means that the scalability is built inside the structure of the model. So we can achieve near sort of super linear increase in the throughput uh, as, we, uh, as we go um, sort of like uh, increase the number of uh, the, the GPUs. Uh, for the latency reduction with more GPUs, it's also the same case. We are able to achieve fairly significant inference performance. Uh, and, and that's fairly, fairly unique uh, to, to the MOE model. So this is some unique properties of MOE that allow us to do that. Uh, compared to like uh, other uh, model, I think just to give a comparison, a 200 billion dense model will take about 50 millisecond for really fast inference. It, it, on the other hand, if you have a 5x larger 1 trillion MOE model, we can now do that in uh, uh, 2x slower time which is a fairly big uh, back gap. But I think this whole thing is just reliant upon whether you have enough MOE models being trained. And if you have them, then deep speed MOE inference already provides fairly practical inference for, for these models. Uh, so I think this is just like reiterating the points why they are so important. Uh, they are fairly cheap in terms of throughput. So if you wanna deploy them at scale, MOE models could provide uh, almost like nine X fast, uh, cheaper throughput compared to a dense model uh, in, in terms of like multi, multi, multiple people querying the model for, for, for requests. Uh, this, is this, the, this is for the workshop. So I'll just sort of briefly go over it. Uh, this is the deep speech software stack. Uh, nothing is uh, uh, hidden in that sense because it's open source, but uh, the, the API starts from the user model. So you have a user model, as I showed in PyTorch, you wrap it around deep speed you get all the goodness under the hood with, with that stack. Uh, there is no other API that you need to learn. Uh, and the same holds true for entrance. Runs pretty much everywhere. Uh, you can explore it on AML if you have on-premises hardware. Also supports AMD GPUs now, so it's not just NVIDIA specific. Uh, and is, here's a simple example from Word, but we're gonna touch a lot on the, on the hands-on workshop on it. So uh, fairly simple PyTorch code, dspe.initialize, you're done. Uh, there's one other aspect that a lot of people have asked. So this is called thing called Deep Speed Launcher, which we will explore a bit more on the IVEX cluster runs. But we just made it as a wrapper because we saw that the, the launching of multiple nodes has been always a challenge for non-HPC users. So they, 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 they don't live in this ecosystem of Slurm. or So they're like, why should we go on all these nodes and SSH and then attach one worker to the other? So it was tedious. So Deep Speed Launcher is basically kind of like an MPI run but for, for Python, PyTorch programs. Uh, a lot of these are available on GitHub. Uh, we're gonna talk in depth. So I, I do invite everyone to come. If you are a hands-on person, please come to the hands-on session. We will explore all these by ourselves. So the graphs will be reproduced hopefully in some sense. <laughs> so there is credibility on those graphs. Uh, there's also some of the inference examples here uh, from the hugging face. So if you know hugging face models, you'll be uh, you'll be surprised how one line code change will give you the 5x benefit I was talking about in the inference performance. So with that, thanks a lot. Uh, we do love community engagement. So please go ahead and make your first poll request if you have something that you notice it's not fixed. There is also an interesting thing that I want to bring about is uh, if, you, if you are here in this session, I would just want all of you to go to github.com slash Microsoft slash deep speed and click on this star thing and, and, and make sure... <laughs> make sure that you all like it. And the reason is, the reason is if you, if you are a Star Wars fan, I, I think at deep speed, we're trying to just cut down that and we're trying to do this. So let's see how many stars we can get at the end of this workshop. I, 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 I want to have 500 stars from Kaust. So when I fly back, I can say, yeah, no, we started at 9.5 and at the end of my flight, we're 10K. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the session. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Uh, thanks, Amar. I, before the uh, um, questions from uh, people here, I would like to ask a couple of questions from the Zoom uh, chat. Uh -oh. So PyTorch also implements fully char sharded uh, data parallel, which they say is inspired by zero stage three for from deep speed. Yes. Are there any differences you, that you know of? Okay, well, I'm glad that somebody actually said that. Uh, so yes, uh, PyTorch FSDP, which is now being called as the alternative to the PyTorch DDP, is fully sharded data parallelism, and it's a re-implementation of zero stage three. So that's for a fact. Uh, the differences are that even initially, when we first started collaborating with PyTorch team, we, we suggested for them to take DeepSpeed as an extension 
and upstream it into PyTorch. Uh, but I think uh, PyTorch engineering teams had some different uh, sort of ways of implementing it. So they, they said, well, we'll credit you, we'll give you the credit, we'll say that this is inspired from zero, uh, but we'll do our own implementation. So, so FSDP is a re-implementation of zero stage three. Uh, having said that, uh, they will, for a long time, I don't think they're gonna support anything like zero infinity though. So the zero infinity or zero offload or zero inference, all of those are deep speed specific features. So with PyTorch FSDP, they, they cannot be supported out of the box. Uh, so that's a benefit over, over FSDP that we still provide. So one other question that I'd uh, put, put through is, is it possible to train a GPT via reinforcement learning using deep speed, just like what chat GPT has done for HFRL? Stay tuned. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> Give us a month. Uh, right. yeah. um, questions? Okay. I'll uh, start from okay. yeah. oh. quickly. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Amar, for this uh, nice uh, presentation. You talk about the hardware and some like for the network and especially CPU, GPU. Today, there are some GPUs that are that have like memory coherency. Uh, can you briefly share about like, for example, like the uh, uh, AMD mm -hmm. MI250 or the upcoming uh, 300 or even the Grasshopper? Mm -hmm. Do you think that will improve this kind of bottleneck, especially between, uh, not only between CPU, GPU, but also between mm -hmm. GPUs? Okay, I think I'll, I'll split that question into two. Uh, Grasshopper, uh, I don't know. I would really want to see that hardware. <laughs> uh, AMD, uh, AMD GPUs, uh, we, uh, at, my, at Microsoft, we have AMD MI100s. They are general availability instances, so people can actually run them. That's the first things we did uh, to support AMD hardware. So AMD has this Rockham thing, which is kind of like translation of the CUDA calls. And then also they have AMD Rickle, which is kind of like nickel. Uh, so it does give you the communication. Uh, so it's uh, the MI100s give you similar performance to V100s, not on par, but similar. MI200s are a little bit more tricky because they're newer. We have yet to stabilize them fully. They were supposed to give similar to A100. Uh, they're not there yet, uh, but DeepSpeed works on them. Uh, so we would love to see a hardware. We don't have a lot of access to these hardwares, honestly. Uh, they're like fairly heavily used within Microsoft as well. So we have, we have, I have yet to have my own hands on like maybe 512 uh, MI200s where I could run something similar to what I did with A100. So uh, that's, the, that's the challenge. But I, effectively, they're, they're very much a copy in, in some sense, like architecture wise MI200s uh, connect to the, this Infinity fabric and then they have the same InfiniBand 8, InfiniBand cards. So all the bandwidth numbers are similar to what an A100 box provides. So there should be no gap, but Theory versus practice is always, you know, like there's a difference. So I, uh, the gap is still there between the performance, but but they do work. Like deep speed uh, works out of the box if you build on uh, on AMD GPUs. Grace Hopper, I would love if you have one, you know, give us access. <laughs> oh, thank you for the interesting talk. Um, my question was about um, how you know. You know, you're using PyTorch, right? And but how much this can be abstracted out from the from the you know the specific you know library that you are using? So, you know, how gen how general is the concept to to go through other you know ML uh, libraries? Sure, sure. So if um, so, the reason why we built on top of PyTorch is just the fact that a large number of teams at Microsoft use PyTorch over, over any other framework. So like TensorFlow used to be used, but I'm not sure who is using TensorFlow anymore in our, at least in the Microsoft. Same thing from MXNet or, or Cafe and the older frameworks. So, so if, if we talk about that line of frameworks, no, there's nothing. PyTorch is the, perhaps the only thing that we wanna support. In terms of the solutions, uh, because we are tied to building on top of PyTorch, right? So, so zero line of things are all implemented in deep speed. Uh, we were hoping that they would be readily exposed through PyTorch, so people would get benefit. Didn't happen. So FSDP is kind of like a reimplementation of zero three. But I think uh, there are other frameworks who have copied, uh, like the, the or inspired the design of DeepSpeed and reimplemented in their own way for zero family of optimizations. And so it's a fairly, like our papers provide pretty much every single detail about what it is. Our talks also do that. It's, it's just a matter of whether you want to re-implement it for the sake of re-implementing or whether you want to re-implement it because you think that there is a gap. 
So because it's open source, what we have seen is like most teams who have seen a gap, they'll report the gap and say, hey, there is a gap here. We want to fix it. Can you fix it or can we collaborate on it? Or here is a fix, take it. So a great example is uh, Amazon, uh, AWS team, uh, contributed a pretty big PR to 0.3 uh, for their AWS instances because they don't have InfiniBand. They have something called Elastic Fabric Adapter. Uh, and they said, well, we have taken 0.3 and made it work on AWS and EFA, and we are contributing a patch and we welcomed it and we upstreamed it and so it's working. So that's how we, I think, we, we believe in sort of community engagement. So like building on top of each other. That's why Hugging Face is one of the, the great examples on this collaboration. So we are a backend for them. They expose everything to their Hugging Face API. All you need to do is set some deep speed flags in their trainer API. And then deep speed just gets as added as a dependency. So instead of re-implementing deep speed in Hugging Face, they chose just to extend it. Uh, so that would be sort of one way of going it. Uh, does that kind of give you some? Uh, yeah, totally. So, mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, uh, okay. So, so, so for that aspect, uh, there are these all concepts are fairly easily abstractable. It's just a matter of the engineering work required to say, let's say, torch has this torch dot cuda dot tensor, right? So, if someone wants to make a library x dot cuda dot tensor then we are happy to take that uh, uh, so i think um, for newer hardware teams have done that like intel has this gaudi gpus they wanted to do something but most of the people are now kind of like given up on creating their own frameworks over pytorch they're like okay pytorch is pretty much everything let's extend pytorch so we we've been kind of benefiting from that ecosystem so far we didn't feel like somebody needs to really do it but if, let's say Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Uh, that's a question. I have two questions. And the first, uh, how many uh, companies are using the DeepSphere? Do you have an idea? Uh, yeah, there was a slide. Uh, quite a few. Quite a few companies. Uh, we have two hundred. We have two million installs. So I, it's very hard to say which. But I, I do know for a fact that AWS is actually sort of Amazon is sort of a Microsoft competitor. They use DeepSpeed in SageMaker. So that, that's a that's a fairly big statement, right? And then Fidelity is using it. Uh, there are um, there are small startups like Eleuther AI, Stability AI, Hugging Face. These are always using DeepSpeed. Uh, there are also so a lot of DeepSpeed installs that we don't know where they're coming from, right? So 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 there are companies. There are also national labs using it. So fairly wide audience. I, I would just sort of invite you to go on the GitHub and see like the the contributors. They are fairly unique from for various companies. Yeah. And uh, that they said uh, that there is uh, in the previous slide that uh, they use a technology that uh, use uh, forward uh, or reduce and uh, backward or reduce. Mm -hmm. like I want to why use the uh, forward uh, or reduce thing. Oh, that was all to all. Okay, yeah. So that's when that's not all reduced. That's all to all. Uh, I think I, I know what you're talking about. Because the current uh, torch is uh, using yeah, or reducing the backward. I remember. Yeah. I think that was this one uh, where you had uh, this one. This, uh, yeah. yeah. So, so let me explain that in a minute. So if you see, uh, you have these FFNs, which are also called MLPs sometimes. So it's just, just like a linear layer. Uh, you have these gates. And in the forward, this gate actually is on a token. So let's say you have eight GPUs and you have eight tokens in your input data. Uh, the tokens will be routed from the gate. So token zero will go to which expert is the job of the gate. And so to do that, we just implement it through an all to all operation. In the forward pass, when your token is route, getting routed, that, that routing is done through the, through the all to all operation. So you do that, and then you do a second all to all at the end of it uh, to get back from the corresponding GPU to the, to the original GPU, that token, and then you continue the forward pass. So it's like, transpose and transpose again to get back the original thing. Does that make sense? Right here. Um, it's in the forward pass and the same thing in the backward pass. This would be the last question for the session. Oh, really? Thank did, you. Did I answer your question? Maybe I can talk offline and explain it a bit more if you want. Is that in the, because the 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is specifically for language models. Yes. Yes. Oh, thank you very much. And um, I say you're talking about optimization methods. You use one bit a dam, mm -hmm. and this kind of technology is used for reduce the communication between different GPUs or reduce the communication between another kind of level. Mm -hmm. Yes. Things. So it's like uh, in Adam, you have this term called momentum. It's an addition to your gradient. You use the momentum to update the gradient. So we compress the momentum from instead of having 16 bits representation, we have one bit representation. So we pack the bits from 16 to one, do the communication in one bit. So now you have 16 X less volume, right? And then uh, you unpack it. So the, these are all GPU kernels that do this. And uh, once you're done, then your communication is in the compressed form and that reduces the overhead of communication. Mm. So we, we still use standard nickel gather point to point operations all to all. Yeah. Mm, thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much. This was an excellent talk. Uh, let us uh, thank the presenter again. Thank you.